thereby undermining its effectiveness in achieving its intended goals. In this way, the Society is hosting today's lecture to forward the discussion on the subject area. I take privilege in introducing the esteemed guest speakers for our le guest, guest lecture today. Our first panelist for today's lecture is Mr. Rahul Bajaj. Mr. Bajaj is presently practicing as an attorney at ERA Law. He also serves as a senior associate fellow at Vidhi Center for Legal Policy. A gold medalist from the University of Nagpur, Mr. Bajaj has worked in the disputes team at Trilegal for a year before pursuing his postgraduate education from the University of Oxford as a Rhodes Scholar. Upon returning to India, he served as a judicial law clerk for Justice D.Y. Chandrachu at the Supreme Court. Mr. Bajaj is a vocal advocate for disability rights and has written extensively for the topic. He was recently made part of the Supreme Court subcommittee which is poised to conduct an audit of how disabled friendly the Supreme Court is. Co-delivering the lecture today, we have Mr. Hussain Khan. Mr. Khan completed his graduation in law from Jamia Islamia. Islamiya. He's presently working as a research fellow in the legal design and regulation team at Vidhi Center for Legal Policy. During the course of his education, he was involved in authoring the Jamia Diversity Census. Additionally, he has worked extensively on the subject of legal education and social inclusivity as part of his efforts in bridging the social gap in terms of access to legal education. He conceptualized and implemented the WAIL, that is the Vidhi Access to Legal Education Fellowship. This fellowship, it aims to provide skill development and career opportunities for young lawyers from marginalized communities through mentorship and support. We're extremely proud and honored to host both of these personalities today. The format for the lecture is as follows. We will have a lecture session by Mr. Bajaj on the aspect of social relevance and accessibility to legal education. This session will be followed by a lecture by Mr. Khan on the aspect of social relevance and inclusivity. Finally, we'll have a question and answer session where the participants can ask questions to the speakers. I now Mr. Rahul to take forward the discussion. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Are we on? Are we unmuted, Hussain? Yes, yes. Sir. Okay. Thanks uh, very much, ma'am, for that very kind introduction. Uh, it's really an honor to be with all of you today. Uh, I don't propose to give a lecture. I will just share some remarks for a couple of minutes, and then I would really like. Uh, to hear from you. I mean, I would like to ask some questions, perhaps they may be leading questions, but I really hope to uh, make you think about the issues that I want to talk about because my experience has been that that will uh, more likely stay with you than sort of a top down method where I'm just reading out some data points to you and kind of feeding you information. Very well. So let me uh, tell you a little bit about, um, you know, the exclusion problems that uh, uh, our law schools face. I mean, we all know that and Hussein's uh, work with the Jamia census, as well as folks who have done these, uh, these studies at NUJS and NLS have uh, brought forward uh, the issue of uh, uh, the exclusionary manner in which the NLUs function, whether it be on the basis of caste, disability, gender, sexual orientation, etc. Uh, when it comes to persons with disabilities in particular, uh, in the Jamia census, for example, they interviewed someone with a locomotor disability who said that uh, the washrooms had basins that were of a height that the person couldn't access. And uh, at NLS, there were 12 students uh, with disabilities as per the census that they conducted the diversity survey and at NUJS 15. But the fact of the matter is that very few such students are actually seen in law firms at, uh, uh, you know, judges chamber and judges chambers litigating. And they are not really part of the social mainstream. And that is the reason why we are not able to prompt the kind of change that we need to see 
to make these places more disabled friendly reasonable accommodation is viewed uh, by most people as uh, something uh, you know that doesn't add some sort of an exception from the norm that they don't really want to make or feel is appropriate to make it's like why are you asking for all this i mean like have, have we not done enough like it that's the kind of sense that one sometimes get like aren't you done yet you know like what more do you want um so that's really what it is like now let me with that uh, preface uh, ask you a few questions um so tell me this uh, how many of you have interned in uh, uh, have pursued a legal internship so far and madam uh, moderator ma'am i will request you for your help in kind of uh, uh, assisting me with this you just have to tell me how many people raise their hands here Madam Moderator. Yes, I think around twelve, thirteen people have raised their hands. Right. Now tell me this: uh, How many of you in these internships have come across students with disabilities, like co-interns that were people with disabilities? Around three people. Two, one. Very well. It's only one person, is it? Yeah, two people as of now. Two people. Okay, very well. Now let's hear from these two people a little bit if they don't mind sharing. I mean, if they are not comfortable speaking, then we won't. But only if they are, I would like to hear from you. Or sort of what the experience was like. You don't need to make any uh, name, any names. It can be on an anonymous basis. You can just say that X interned with me. X had this disability. This was the nature of the experience. So just tell me. uh one of those two people anyone you can just unmute yourself and speak up hey hello hi uh, yeah this? i am interning with shurwat foundation right now and i come shwab across foundation yeah that's the social shwab oh. fellowship the, the, those are the folks that give that is it uh yeah and uh, the second thing is that uh I come across a person who is uh, disabled and interning with me right now. And the uh, first thing I want to share uh, on panel is that I am also a disabled person. I have uh, some okay. sort of disability in myself, and I am a first year, first year student at GNLU Gandhi. Okay. So, what's that experience been like of interning there for you and for this other person? uh actually the experience is that uh, the government is saying that they do much for the disabled person but actually they didn't because uh, uh just providing the facility to walk or uh, make a, a uh, make a place disabled friendly doesn't uh, make that person happy enough because you have to um, you have to motivate that person to go and do something actually you have to do this because uh, the person uh, who is interning there or who is disabled in itself has a uh, some sort of uh, sh social awkwardness which he has to face it and uh, and just for the change the, uh, the government has to need, get some awareness uh, among the people so that they can be treated equally in the eyes of the people not in the eyes of law uh because uh, law is there to support us but uh, there is nothing uh, if the people want to discriminate they will discriminate so yeah it was kind of difficult but uh, yeah it's it's a nice experience at at first of so i guess the takeaway that you get is that while a lot of promises are made about what the government is doing for the disabled and while there are strong legal guarantees the situation on the ground is fundamentally different yeah what the second person like to say something no all right no problem i would like to ask uh, one more question now how many of you have participated in a law school activity that has a moot court competition uh, debate uh, paper writing activity uh, organizing a conference uh, anything of this sort with a disabled peer madam you will have to help me out again 
Yes, um, eight people have raised their hands. Awesome. So at least there, the amount of the number of people who have had this experience, total we have about 16 people in this. Uh, how many people do we have today actually attending this? We have about 77. 77. 77 people, very well. So at least we have a 10% success rate with this one. Um, so I would like to hear from some of these people who have raised their hands as to what the experience was like of uh, having this student uh, with a disability be in their midst and uh, what challenges they faced or, or anything that they would like to share about the experience. Anyone can speak up. Uh, I mean, please feel free to speak up, or maybe a moderator ma'am can help with that out. Um, sure. Uh, Samar, would you like to go ahead? I I'm see. Yeah. Uh, hi, Rahul. Uh, this is Samar. So uh, I did intern. Uh, I did uh, go through this negotiation competition, all those things. So they are quite, and also debate competition also. So in debate competition, I quite like around the expression which the person is facing. So you know, it's hard to frame the arguments according to their or the person is listening to you or not. So you know, these are very general problems which you know we have to face like daily basis also. So it's. It's not much in the competitions, but uh, when I entered in the law school, so there were some problems re in regarding to the uh, this orientation sessions. It was not accessible, so I was not able to learn the things very often. So it's it's reflected in my uh, pre preparation of On what things. Sorry, just one second, Samar. Uh, what what things were you not able to learn? You're saying. Uh, some orientation type of thing, na? like there is some uh, like debating competition is going on and the mood mood problem moods are going on. So they will showcase how to uh, draft a memo and all those things. If they, these things are not inclusive and not accessible friendly, so a disabled can learn. Why not? Account. Why not? Summer, uh, just uh, pause. Can you say a little bit about what the barriers are like actually? The barriers are like at my time it was a COVID times, right? So they will just uh, this present the things at the Zoom calls and all those PPTs type of thing. So it was not accessible, right? It was the almost scan copies and all those things. You were not able to scan this, you know. In the memos, it's more about drafting how to draft the thing, right? Right. So, uh, so these are the basic problems which you know if, if we can make this things very inclusive. So in the orientation sessions also, you can even most of the things I learned in my second year and in the fourth semester, which you know people just learn in the in the when they just enter in the law school because they benefited from the orientation sessions. But I learned the things from my peers and from my own efforts when I spend time on a lot of things. So these are some of the barriers which I face in the competition or the some activities which are very leading for the law school. So just to summarize what Summer is saying, that there are a large number of accessibility barriers that disabled students face in participating in these activities, which are some of which are attributable to structural barriers such as lack of access to appropriate materials, uh, absence of uh, effective learning, learning methodologies to include students with disabilities. And the emphasis is really on the person himself or herself taking the effort to learn such things, which is why there is a learning loss and a delay in that person actually acquiring that knowledge, which their peers may have acquired much earlier and therefore their peers may be able to steal a march over them in that way. Okay, anyone else? So this is what Summer is saying. I'd like to hear from a couple more people. Madam Moderator, could you ask any of the others, please? Sure. Um... I see that Dalia, Khadija, and Savita, all of you raised your hands. So if Dalia, you would like to um, unmute and share your experience. Uh, hi, hi, everyone. Oh. So yeah, I graduated from uh, Kashmir University yeah. uh, Law Department, and, and I have been organizing ample number of events. You know, I participated in uh, moots and other debates as well. But most of the things I was used to do that was that were uh, organizing the events. So I was the uh, part of the law society, uh, and we had uh, two or three students who were uh, disabled, who were physically disabled. And uh, what I observed is that they were not able to, you know, come up. They were very hesitant 
hesitant with their abilities they were they were very shy to come forward and participate in the events even mm-hmm. even volunteering the events even if if they come they they used to get more attention than the normal students which made them more nervous to participate in the events mm-hmm. in this what i would just ha uh, ha uh, your point is well taken i just make one qualification they said normal students i would just uh, suggest that you use the word able bodied because the normal abnormal paradigm may, may be a little problematic but you yeah, otherwise your little... point han ji your point is otherwise well taken okay so let me then in the 6 or 7 because i need, i have a hard stop at 6:30 unfortunately and then i can maybe come in for a little while when there is q and a Uh, let me then move towards talking about what the solutions are because all of us are well acquainted with the problem so a few basic questions to all of you which will hopefully prompt you to think when you put up when you use instagram or facebook and or twitter and put up pictures of whatever activity you are doing how many of you add image descriptions to the to those pictures I do that. We have around seven, eight people who raise their hands. And uh, I would like one of them to tell us what an image description is. Uh, may I explain? Please. A uh, image description is that uh, who who can't able to see or can't able to actually get what is there in the picture is in. it in written format we explain that what is happening in the picture and what is this picture is trying to convey to the people understood so basically for those who are not able to see a picture i e those who have a visual impairment they won't be able to understand what is in the picture unless there is a description correct and image descriptions are the way that we can describe what is there in the picture for the benefit of those who have such visual impairments Uh, you tell me out of 77 if it is the case that only eight people are putting such pictures or image descriptions up that means the rest 70 it's not like they are not using instagram today everyone uses mostly that means they are not doing it so all this talk about inclusion and diversity and all is good when it comes to a census or survey but practically you know even that small little thing we are not doing to ensure that disabled student disabled friends partners whatever it is that we are catering to their uh, making ourselves inclusive towards them theek okay? hai so that's point number 1 now tell me now that you know what an image description is and why it is important how many of you will actually put up image descriptions with all your pictures from now on I think right now around thirteen people have raised their hands, but I can see the count rising. So no, push so far, okay, brother. At least on that front, I am certain that at least now I will see more image descriptions. Uh, point number one, ये हो गया, ठीक है? अब point number two. Uh, let let me ask you this: When you upload a PDF document onto a website, like you may be part of your law school. Uh, committee then tomorrow you may work in law firm where you may upload a document on a website uh do you know the difference between an accessible uh, sort of searchable pdf and an image based pdf do you know that difference actually between an accessible and inaccessible pdf does anyone know the difference uh yes if uh, uh can i speak here yes. okay so uh please madam be my guest if a pdf is made by pictures uh, it becomes inaccessible because you cannot search in it let's say if you export uh, on the other hand from word uh, uh, straight away then it is searchable the text is searchable and it can be read aloud uh, using softwares that are uh, now uh, readily available uh, and it takes a bit harder like if someone has some other software it makes it a bit harder to access if it's uh, based on image especially if it's uh, handwritten pictures and you have uploaded it in pdf Uh, and written ya fir if the scan quality is poor if the letters are not clear then if you have to 
access it. This happened to me, you know, this happens to me almost on a daily basis at my workplace, you know, where I have to access judgments from SCC. A lot of them are image based, the true prints. I have to access government circulars, client correspondence, um, you know, uh, filings. And you can imagine how stressful it is even normally with all the work pressure that one has and in litigation timelines are short. And then on top of that, even this aspect, people are not yeah, people don't keep in mind. So let me ask you this. If you have a colleague with a disability tomorrow uh, in an internship or in a law school setup, how many, okay, two questions. Number one, how many of you were aware of this accessible, inaccessible PDF till now, this issue? Is there a show of hands, please. I think very few people, around five people have raised their hands. And how many, now that they know why this is important and why this matters, will make sure that whenever they have a student with a disability in an activity or in an internship or whatever, that they ask them whether the PDF that they are sharing is accessible or not. How many? I think close to everyone is raising their hands around 20, 21 people have raised it already. This is excellent. Now, one final question and then I'm done. Uh, let me ask you this. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, accessing our courts, okay? So, how many of you have till now uh, thought about the issue of how disabled friendly our courts are in the sense that is it possible for someone with a disability to access the courtrooms, to be able to argue cases on their own, to be able to, uh, you know, get from one courtroom to the other? How many of you have thought about these issues till now? I see that around 11 people have raised their hands. So not many. And then, Hanji, and then how many of you now that you have this information, are more likely to take this into account with small little things such as ensuring that if you have a friend with a disability, if you have a colleague you know who's interning somewhere, you connect them with someone in a form that you know that okay, look, this person may have these additional needs, they may need this support, can you provide them that or offering to go with them uh, you know, if you don't have any other work to court, helping them with these things. How many of you are going to do that now? Wow, a lot of people. So around 28 people have raised their hands and more. Very well. So at least these three things also, if you do, number one, having image descriptions, number two, having accessible documents and working towards it. Overnight to problem solve, I have a lecture and accessibility issues solve. But at least even this much, if you will do, tomorrow if you are my colleague at ERA Law where I work, or if you are my colleague at Vidhi where I work, or if you are my colleague, uh, you know, admission accessibility where I work, or if you are my colleague when I practice in the courts, and if you are aware of this, number one, image description, number two, document accessibility, number three, physical accessibility, it will make a world of difference to that person. And of course, I can't address the broader structural issues now in terms of underrepresentation of students with disabilities in law schools. And these issues don't have easy solution. Whatever it means, I mean, I will sleep a happy person tonight knowing that at least this much I have been able to encourage you to do. So with that, I will leave you for today and I'll hand it over to Hussein. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity. And uh, I'll probably join you a little for a little while when the Q&A session turns comes around. If you have any other questions, you can always email me. Hussein will share my email address with you, my Madam Moderator. You can pass it on to whoever wants to reach out to carry forward this discussion or has any other questions that I can help them with. Many thanks. Definitely, sir. Thank you so much for that extremely engaging and thought-provoking insights. I would now invite Mr. Hussain to share his thoughts and take the session forward. Over to you, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you so much, Madam Moderator, and thank you so much, Rao. It was an amazing 30 minutes, very educational for me as well. So I'll just take a comfort break of two minutes.
uh, like I'll just drop Rahul till the door and then I'll continue with my speech. Sure, sir. Yes. Uh, hi, everyone. So, firstly, thank you so much for this opportunity. Both Rahul and I are honored to give this talk, and and and, and it's great to be invited by Constitutional Law Society. And you guys are doing great work, which is reflected from the concept note that you shared along with the invitation. It's very well researched and very well written. So what Rahul so far did was to talk about one specific issue of accessibility. And it's great that now we know the practical issues and it's great that Rahul talked about a little bit from his experience and some of you also talked about what is it that you faced. So now what we'll do is that we'll zoom out a bit and we'll take a broader view of the entire situation of access to legal education. It was necessary for Rahul to talk about one issue deeply so that you can sort of develop your roots into the issue. Now we assess the situation more broadly. So as the concept note has clearly mentioned that, that yes, Upendra Bakshi talked about social relevance. So I'll just give you a quick background. So it was Upendra Bakshi who came up with the idea of making legal education more socially relevant. And that significantly influenced Dr. Madhav Menon when he started talking about establishing an independent law school that will produce lawyers who are going to help access justice. And what I'm going to do here is to just explain what are the concepts of access, inclusion, diversity and how it operates, then I think at the end of this talk, we will be very well aware and in a position to re-articulate these points when next time somebody says that, hey, what is access? Access to legal education does not matter or does not exist because after all, it's all merit and everything is fair. So, 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 so the thing is that the idea of establishing NLS was to produce lawyers who are going to fight for people who are unable to access justice. But then that thing did not happen ever since uh, the economy was opened up. And in early 2000s, as one of the people uh, I interview, he's from NLS and he's currently a professor at Yale. He said that when he was a student in, in early 2000s, things started changing. The person who was just walking out of World Bank became the VC. Subjects such as labor laws were taken off the mandatory list. And then slowly and gradually, social demographics of the student body started changing. And now, 23 years later, today the situation is that these NLUs are becoming more and more expensive, as a result of which it is becoming more exclusive or inaccessible for persons who belong to deprived backgrounds. So, so, so. So what are the forms and stages of exclusion? Because, because we have talked a lot about access. I think access takes place at two stages. The first stage is, and you, and you all can note this down if you want. First stage is, it's one stage is pre-admission stage. Now in this stage, what happens is that students are unable to prepare, attempt or clear CLAT, and, and eventually they are unable to procure admission. And as we know that the CLAT fees is very high, it's about 5,000 rupees. So many students get even preempted. They don't even appear for CLAT. Forget about finally procuring admission. And the situation, the financial background of our students is also of varied kinds. So it's not that only if you are struck with absolute poverty will you be able to, will you fail to access a law school. It's also when you have some capital 
and you find that hey my parents have about about 10 lakhs rupees in their bank and what i can do is that i can use my parents years of savings to procure admission or i can go to a traditional law school and get a five year law degree that's where the concept of return on investment comes in you may you find that spending 10 lakhs rupees of my parents hard earned money is in, is actually a huge emotional cost as well as a financial cost and therefore the investment is too high and the return that is the bllb degree is too small a return and so that so and this group is the one which is least talked about and especially if you are a middle class family in new delhi then you are you, then you are in a, very, in a in a very troublesome situation because you are neither coming from a small town or village because you are from new delhi nor you are poor so you can't get scholarships so so you are stuck in some kind of a limbo where you can't even you have no local standard to complain because hey you are in delhi and hey you are not poor you 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 have a bike you have even a small car so what is the problem so that's why we need to understand this concept of roi and and my intention is to prime you all with tools so that next time who somebody strikes a conversation on this you should be able to talk about all these situations all these points another another point is of course when you are stuck with some absolute poverty then of course you 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 in fact get preempted by clat fees and in case you do crack clat you are not able to pay the fee of an nau and that's the category of students that came across in huge numbers at jamia some of my closest friends were getting nlus one of them was getting nlu jodhpur the other was getting nlu o yes nlu o but then he didn't go for it because of course it was very expensive for him so so yeah i mean and 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 you know for example recently also at one of the top law schools there was sudden increase in fees now of course that increase in fees might have been there for legitimate reasons i'm not going to that of course the state support might be less but the, but my only point is limited that is when we increase the fees of a law school students from deprived background automatically start getting preempted it becomes an island of the rich it becomes even more elusive and in fact facts are quite interesting if you just look at the data at jamia in almost 49.9% that's 50% of students had an income of less than 50000 rupees per month whereas such students that is the students whose family income was less than 50000 rupees per month were only 19% so just imagine on one hand at nls there are 19% such students at and at jamia there are 50% and of course like like these this is only a small fact that i'm sharing but but it is it explains the situation and likewise students who had a monthly income of more than 1 lakh rupees were 21% and at nls you they were 53% so so yeah i mean now you can see that we can draw a conclusion which has been problematic and people have you know struck arguments with me everywhere that now we can draw a conclusion that there is some correlation between merit that is the ability to crack clat and for final admission i i mean financial status so these on so so now we can correlate that people who have some level of money are able to study there and are able to become meritorious that means it's not just hard work alone along with hard work you need some level of financial capital and in order to get some financial capital you also need to have some social capital because financial capital does not exist as a as as a isolated sphere it overlaps with other spheres such as such as size of the city no doubt your caste your religion and in some individual instances gender also so this is one tricky aspect that i've talked about and i'll be happy to take questions on this and so so i'll discuss more the point of merit 
So when I, I, I have my own uh, initiative, it's called Push Towards Merit, where I train students from traditional law schools and deprived backgrounds. I train them in public speaking and, and in getting internships and, and some general handholding. So I have been criticized that, hey, merit is oppressive because only rich people are able to become meritorious. So why I also believe that is true, in order to make legal education accessible, we need not rise up in a protest or, or some kind of a revolution that from now onwards, merit is nothing. We will give equal opportunity to everybody and everybody is equally eligible and merit is oppressive, therefore let's chuck it out. That is one school of thought and that is, according to me, problematic. There is another school of thought that says that, that hey, merit is important, yes. However, we need to consider the fact that there are many who are from deprived backgrounds who might be performing at the same level or might be a bit inferior in their performance. But the fact that they're coming from a deprived background shows that they do have the ability to overcome social barriers. And therefore, the fact that they can overcome social barriers instead of being born with a silver spoon and in mouth and make a lateral entry to a law school or any, any elite office shows that there is some level of respect that needs to be given to those who are disadvantaged by some, by some social factor. And this is the school of thought that I at least at this stage of my life, because of course I might years down the line realize that hey, I was wrong. So I'm open to, I would like to meet an academic skepticism. But then at this stage of my life, I feel that merit is important and we need to train students from deprived backgrounds in attaining that merit. What is merit? Merit is actually social, it's a skill. So we have to become skillful and we have to help others so that all of us can work together in a law school or work together in a in a in an office. Is there some internet issue? Yeah. So, so this is the pre-admission stage. So whatever we have discussed happens before you appear for CLAT or before you take admission. Now, the next category of exclusion, which is very less talked about, is the post-admission exclusion. That is the exclusion that you face after procuring admission, either in some national law university or a top national law university, or in a traditional law school such as Jamia, BHU, AMU. Now, in a top, let's begin with traditional law schools. In a traditional law school, you face different exclusion by different stakeholders. One important stakeholder is of course your employer, as Rahul also talked about that everybody wants to be reasonably accommodated and persons with disabilities are not reasonably accommodated. So similarly, those who might not be disabled but might be belonging to a deprived background or a traditional law school which disproportionately populate students from deprived background as the data of NEJS, NLS and Jamia studies reflect might be getting excluded. So as one of the interviewees in the Jamia report said that the fact that she was from Jamia, she was paid less. And at a point came when she became senior associate in, a, in one of the top law firms, she became a senior associate and the associate was walking from a fresh graduate of an NAU was getting higher pay. When she went up to the, the founder of that office, he said, okay, no, I won't increase the salary. Then she said, hey, I'll move on with my life. I'll quit. Then she went on to join some other law firm where she became a senior associate and she was getting paid as much. And it's not at all the case that she was an underperformer. Right now, in fact, after working in that law firm, she went on to a, get in, got into an Ivy League college to do her MBA and she's working in one of the top firms, accounting firms in the world. So it means that the fact that you are belonging to some level of some kind of a deprived background led to an exclusion in post-admission life by an employer. This can happen to an intern, it can happen to an associate. So this is one category of stakeholders who exclude you. Now the second category of stakeholders are students. So one of I conducted a focus group discussion as part of the Jamia Diversity Census. So they talked about that when they went for one for 
uh, moot court competition. Others, and they cleared the rounds, they defeated other NMUs. One of the teams from top law schools rose up in protest and they said that, hey, they are from Jami, we're from NMUs. How can they defeat us? So this is just a manifestation of larger thought processes of exclusion that are running through our veins and, and minds. And my intention is only to just make you aware that, that all this is actually happening. It's just that many people don't care about it, they don't have time, but it's a part of my life's project. So I'm just making all these efforts to onboard you with me on this larger movement to make education inclusive. But then the fact that I'm from Jamia does not at all mean that I'm endorsing it to be the most inclusive institution. It is definitely more accessible for people from regional back, like from tier four and three cities, the towns and villages, to be more specific, those who are from poor households. But there is some level of exclusion taking place at Jamia also. For example, members of Jamia Queer Collective, which is not a formal body as of now, complain that they feel excluded because they were outlet, their request to formalize the collective was rejected. They were like, hey, why do you want a queer collective? So Jamia is accessible, but it exists with its own version of inclusion, exclusion. But at the same time, there are those who feel included. For example, conservative Muslims feel, do feel included in Jamia, who otherwise feel excluded in uh, in another, another law school, such as any NLU or any traditional law school, which is not a Muslim minority institution. So now this is a tricky situation or, or a tricky point, which requires more clear interpretation. I have not been able to succeed to clarify my thoughts on this. So I would like to leave these thoughts on you, that is Jamia inclusive or not? A chunk of people do feel it's included, it's giving access to deprived groups, but some people also feel excluded from it. And I, I was from New Delhi, so people from New Delhi were less. So maybe I can also say that I felt excluded for, for being from tier one city, whereas mostly students were from towns and villages. So that's your, for you to figure out. You can think about it after this talk, and you can also reach out to me to share your thoughts. So, so yeah, this is the kind of exclusion which takes place both at the campus as well. But now coming to exclusion at top NLUs, you might be the fact that you crack NLU, top NLU, like I, I would like to speak in the context of NLS because that's the study I've read deeply and have been involved with students and graduates from that law school. Simply because you have been able to crack that law school does not mean that your life is chill and, and you're having a good time. Even there, the fact that you paid, you use almost the entire of your parents' income creates some pressure. So you face exclusion on the basis of your financial background in everyday life. People are going to party, people are buying sweatshirts, which might be expensive or might be contributing for, for, a, for a party. In those everyday instances, you become withdrawn from everyday life. You, you get withdrawn from the campus climate as they as experts use the term so the fact that campus climate is not accepting of your identity or or your preferences excludes you so this is just for us to and and, and this was only on the basis of financial background you can get excluded on the basis of sex on the basis of your regional background your caste and and other social factors so this is how admission takes place in pre-admission stage and post-admission stage. Now let's move on to that. What kind of intervention can we really make? So at this stage of pre-admission, primarily organizations such as IDIA, Increasing Diversity by Increasing Access, who I've been involved with for some six years, some seven years now. And in the, and their intervention primarily is at the stage where students are either in school or they have just completed their school and they train them to access the top law schools primarily. They primarily increase top law schools. So that is the, their focus is on the pre-admission stage. 
and there is another initiative called uh, Arlen. That is not that's not a registered organization, but it's a fledgling initiative called Access to Legal Education for Muslims, and it can be abbreviated as Arlen. They focus. It was started when Professor Shamla Pashir and one more professor reached out to other people, and they said that hey, IDI is trying to increase access of deprived groups, but there is a pattern within who gets to access these law school, these law schools from amongst the deprived groups. They identified that Muslims are unable to crack that even when we are making an intervention such as the IDIA does. So that's when access to legal education for Muslims took place. So Alim right now is focusing on post-admission inclusion, that is students who are who have taken admission in the traditional law schools and can't do really can't do anything about it. So they are training students to deal with post-admission exclusion by providing handholding, mentorship, and conducting sessions for them. And likewise, I I focus on uh, as as my moderator said that I have started with the access to legal education fellowship at the Center for Legal Policy. What we are focusing is on the final year and the graduate, the recent graduates, the lawyers. We are focusing on that stage. We are helping them to build better careers because that's when we find ourselves that oh, the situation is terrible. I can't do anything. I do not have a network. I do not have space, and I can't, cannot do anything in life. That's when Wade Fellowships makes an intervention and tells them that hey, it's okay. You come to our office, we'll train you over a period of six months, we'll pay you a 10,000 of your stipend, and then let's see what, what, what really happens when you get out. So these are the kind of interventions that can really be made. So in next part, I would like to go a bit deeper into the question of merit. So now we, I'm sure some of you do agree with me that yes, meritorious students who usually happen to be those coming from um, rich families and privileged groups tend to crack clad. But even those who crack clad and get into a law school, even those law schools witness a trend where those who belong to privileged backgrounds end up performing better than others. So it's, it's, and it's quite interesting to look at it. I'll just refer to my notes and tell you a couple of things. Let's begin with Jamia. So among high scholars at Jamia, I define high scholars as those who got CGPA, SGPA of more than 7.5. We get out of nine. So those who scored between 7.5 and nine are high scorers according to me. So among the high scorers, for the biggest caste group was formed by Sayyids. So Sayyids are is the upper caste, uppermost caste among Muslims, and fifty percent. I mean, among the toppers, Sayyids were fifty percent, and the second biggest group was of, I, I mean, from among Hindus, they, it was Brahmins. So we see that the two group, religious groups which are represented at Jamia because Sikh, Jains, Buddhists are almost nil at Jamia. I mean, we came across only six, I think only three six students were there. So primarily it's only Hindus and Muslims at Jamia. And both big, the most privileged or top of the hierarchy caste groups are the biggest groups among the toppers, among the high scorers at Jamia. And this is quite revelatory. And the smallest caste group was formed by OBCs. And coming down to family income, those who were toppers, their family income was 11 lakhs 83,139 rupees. And coming down to Jamia's average income, that was 9 lakhs 72,457. So we see that there is almost a 3 lakh gap, gap of 3 lakhs rupees between average income and income of those who are toppers. Now let's move on to NLS. So average income at NLS is 19, 21 lakhs something, 21.3 if I'm not wrong. 
and income of the toppers is 29 lakhs. So we see that there is a huge gap between the family incomes of both the groups. And one interesting thing is that the even among high scorers, the toppers, those who got like at Jamia, those who got between eight and nine, there were nine students who scored such a high CGPA, and all of them were women. And at NLS also, among the toppers, all of them were women. Now, this is an important observation that, that on the grounds of sex, we find one group that is advantage and disadvantage. Men constitute the advantage group and women the disadvantage group. However, in academics in these law schools, among the toppers, women are performing better. So it's one interesting observation that I came across, but this requires further interpretation and further study that, that how can we make an intervention to, to make law schools more inclusive on the basis of sex? Because by citing this data that, hey, all the toppers are women, we cannot say that exclusion of women is not taking place. For example, even at Jamia, the hostel timings was such that women had to be back in their hostels by 7 p.m., whereas male students did not really have any timing at all. I mean, they could just walk in any time. So this affects their mobility. And mobility refers to equality of opportunity. Because, of course, when we can roam around the campus, we might hit conversations which can give us an opportunity. So in this manner, data can at times be deceptive. So just ensure to look at everything in a larger context. If women are almost all, like all, the, all the toppers of women, does not mean that the institution is inclusive on grounds of sex. So, so yeah, so, 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 so now let's, I won't take much of your time. And given that I only have two minutes and let's jump into some final thoughts that what do we do now? If that's what the situation is. The problem is systemic. It starts from grassroots. And the fact that students cannot go to good schools where English is being good English is being taught, then that's yes, I'll take questions in the end. So the fact that they did not go to a good school, that's when the situation or, or the process of exclusion starts. And why is it that that start? It starts because your parents might not have enough money to send you a school, which is in, which provides education in English medium. And why is it that your parents do not have enough money? Probably their parents did not have enough money. And simply because they, you do not have some, enough money does not mean that your parents are not hardworking. Probably the hardest working employee in our office is the watchman. And probably the chef who wakes up at 3 a.m. every day just to give us food. And he sleeps at 11. He's, he's surviving on a five hour sleep. He's probably more hardworking than me. So what's, what's happening? Probably the issue is deeper. Maybe you belong to a caste group, which has historically been, been excluded, or a religious group, or you might not have enough money to go to a good school and build a social network. Because going to a good school such as modern school in New Delhi or DPS gives you access to important children of important people who actually become life, lifelong allies. In fact, even in my school, uh, those who were up on the stage and performing and giving speeches were those who had influential parents, who trained them, who told them since the childhood, hey, you need to read books, you need to speak like this. I'm from Don Bosco School, which is a Christian minority institution, and it is one of the good schools in Delhi. And what I really did was that, of course, as a young teenager full of uh, full of uncontrolled emotions, I decided that one day I'll become the cultural captain and I'll change things forever. It should not be the teachers who should decide who will speak, because again, teachers look at meritorious students, and meritorious students are those who are belonging who belong to rich families. So I decided in my class seven that when I reach class twelve, I'll become cultural captain, and. And this is just sharing one experience. And in class 12, I applied for the position of cultural captain. Elections were held. And eventually, I won with a thumping majority. 
the second day I prepared a research note, went to the principal and said that from now onwards it should be the school council, that is the head boy and me who should decide who will speak and not the teachers. The principal gave green card, I mean, green signal. And that year we saw new faces coming up on stage. They, were, they might not be most fluent, they might not be most confident while articulating their points. But they were new faces and they had an opportunity that which could tell them that, hey, so far you were sitting among the audience in one corner, but today you're speaking. That means you can further participate in such activities and become one of the best speakers in the country, maybe in the world. So that's probably one achievement that I can think about of my school days. So a message for you, as Rahul also said, that as students, we need to think about our counterparts in our class who might be blind for whom you should insert image description, who for whom you need to provide reasonable accommodation at your personal level. So likewise, along the same lines, my request to you is that you might come across students in your internship offices who might be hesitant, who might not have that confidence, who might be sitting in one corner. Your job is to sort of open them up, teach them what is it that you know by virtue of studying at NLUO, or at NLUO itself, there might be students who are walking from coming from some village. And then, and you'll find that they remain in one corner. They might not have strong social skills or they might not have confidence. So it's your job to onboard them with, hey, chalo, let's have coffee. Try to be friends with them and teach them. Because it's a lifelong project. And I'm sort of a victim of exclusion. That's the reason I made a life project and, 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 and it is not really the Vail Fellowship is taking chunk of my time. This is not forming, forming an important part of my performance at Vidhi. My performance at Vidhi is assessed by my research work. This is just extra, you can say, social or like burden that I'm taking in order to make some difference. And alone I cannot really do this because it's a long movement and which we might not win for many years, but it will go on for 100, 200 years. So each one of you has to become a leader and try to make allies to contribute in your own ways, either at an interpersonal level. I started at an interpersonal level, then started doing things at my school and in my law school at Jamia, where I started pushed towards it, and now at Vidhi, now where we have started Veil Fellowship and we even secured a funding of 20 lakhs rupees for six months. But this is me alone. You all have to become a leader in your own way. So yeah, I mean, this is what the solution is. I mean, even though I have typed down different set of solutions, but I really don't want to get into all that. I mean, like that won't help much. So, so yeah, I mean, I'll be happy to take questions in the end. But yeah, that's it from my end. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for those extremely comprehensive remarks. Uh, we would now be opening the floor for questions. The format for the same will be simple. Anybody who has questions may please raise their hands. And upon being recognized, they may unmute and proceed to ask their questions. So um, anyone who has questions, please raise your hand. Right. Um, I see that Khadija, you've raised your hand. Uh, please go on. Yeah, Khadija, the first year student at Jamal Islam. Yes, uh, student of a traditional. Yes, please go. <laughs> As a student of a traditional law school, I have been asked this question in debates and in real life as well. Uh, but. Uh, the way Jamia uh, deals with uh, inclusion is uh, very traditional, like reservation. Uh, a lot of people criticize reservation and they say maybe scholarships or some other programs can replace reservations. Uh, do you have a point of view on that? Uh, do we completely uh, replace reservations? Are they still important, relevant? Uh, what exactly are your point of view uh, on it? Like in the yeah, I, I, okay, yeah, very interesting questions and something which is very controversial also. But then I would like to refer to the inefficacy of reservation. For example, at Jamia, we have 50% reservation for those who do not know, 50% reservation for Muslims. And it is divided into three categories. First category constitutes a 30%, which goes to Muslims 
girls who belong to general category could be one of obc or one of women it's it's available to all including obc and women so no special provision is there for one group then next 10 percent is for muslim women only if you are a woman as well as a muslim and you have not been able to secure admission in general category will you be able to secure a place here and the third category of muslim obcs so my research shows that in the muslim general category it is the upper caste muslims who are securing the benefit of the reservation the lower caste muslims obcs and and even sts scheduled tribe muslims are not able to get into the law school so i would like to maintain some level of humility by saying that i do not know what's the best way forward because it would be an entire research policy research project to find answers into it but definitely the problem may be solved by further dividing this reservation by providing for a reservation for muslim sts and and probably some kind of criteria maybe you can we can tweak the criteria so that we can do indirect affirmative action to include those who are from lgbt community or or are from, from further deprived backgrounds either on the basis of caste or on the basis of uh, uh on the basis of financial background so those are the thoughts which i haven't been able to thought think through because it requires a complete research project so yeah reservation can only help to an extent for example uh, the smallest religious group in nlus is a muslims so making a reservation for them might help increase the access of muslim students but then the question is that what kind of muslims are able to access it at jami it's the sayyids who are accessing it at nlus i in my opinion and this opinion not is not based upon any study but i feel that if there will be a reservation at jami for muslims then it is the rich muslims upper caste muslims who and most of them might be men who will eventually make it to nls or any of the nlus so reservation is not the best solution in my opinion it is just a quick fix quick political fix i think solution lies in change make starting introducing change at the grassroots level by coming up with a systemic remedy because this problem is systemic and not only at the grassroots level but also in schools you need to my jami study report provides a recommendation that you need to come up with committees which train students in english speaking provides them some kind of handhold so yeah those are my thoughts but no conclusive answer on that point thank you sir we have um harshvardhan has raised his hand um please go ahead am i audible yes uh i just want to ask what are the kind of factors that actually are in our hands and that can actually bridge that social gap because as a disabled student who cannot really hide his disability and who has got an nls in the class 2023 i just i really feel hesitant to proceed further with the admission process act as it will be a very risky investment for me Uh, so, so your question is, if I got it right, that what is it that students can do who have cracked CLAT but do not have social and financial capital to procure admission? Is that what you're asking? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, you, you know the situation is a bit. It turns people a bit helpless, of course, because. for example i i did not even appear for clat because of some personal reasons and there are many who are unable to do that so my suggestion is that you can start firstly accept that you cannot really do anything about it but go to a law school which is already there in an area which can give you some potential network so if for example jami is in new delhi so that's one advantage it is cheap so these are the advantages you need to think about but most importantly focus on your articulation so even i did not like i am fluent today but i was not always so fluent so what i would do was that i would just every day stand in front of mirror and talk about a legal point or talk about how did my day go about so those things really place me in a position where 
where I could really articulate my point clearly. And most importantly, the fact that you can articulate your point clearly helps you shun all the social barriers. If you are poorest person in the in the in a room, you have no network. The fact that you can articulate your point clearly is going to help you win allies. Is going to help you get recognition, and is going to help you shun every social barrier and secure opportunities for yourself. So yeah, my suggestion would be to to you know accept that the situation is bad, and let people like me and try to encourage people like me who are making some humble efforts at a systemic le level. Because right now, weight fellowship is a small thing, but I want to make it big so that students like you refer to do not face a problem. And also, I feel helpless. There's really nothing that we can do about it. The lucky ones can be helped by MDIA. And some lucky ones can secure funding through through uh, through education loan, but that also creates a lot of emotional pressure, and not all succeed in getting education loans or or, or succeed in fundraising. So yeah, that's my suggestion. Thank you. Um, I see um, Khadija. I think you raised your hand again. Uh, do you have? Yeah. Can, can we take questions from uh, from the chat box, if possible? Sure, sir. Um, yeah. So I'll only can 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 you read it out, uh, moderator, ma'am, please? Definitely. Um, we have a question from Shorya, which says that according to you, which is better, tier one NLU's or private colleges? As nowadays, the fees of both of them is almost the same, like Christ University. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that's an interesting question. And after that, I'll go back to Khadija. So yeah, according to yeah, I mean, like this is not particularly a question concerning access to legal education. Uh, I feel that you know, tier one any use might be better. Of course, they have bigger name. They they reflect more nicely on your CV. And at the same time, private universities are equally expensive, but then they are not as big in big names. So you won't be able to enjoy the goodwill factor as much in a private university. So yeah, I think first question is more in interesting by Harsh Falcon. I think he asked it himself. How much how much does academic performance affect that social divide? So that seems like a different different line of question. Um, academic performance, like across the globe, like other studies also conducted in the US, clearly reflect that yeah, academic performance and social capital have strong correlation. And once you are good in academics, then yes, of course, social divide gets affected to an extent. And it can also help you get, get mobility. That's why so many students from deprived backgrounds prefer to go for UPSC and judiciary as per the data because you, because uh, performing well in those exams gets you performing well uh, gets you quick mobility. So yeah, we can probably we have more hands. Uh, so we have so madam moderator can I take lead on taking up questions? Yes sir definitely. Yeah. Okay, so Anubhav, can you go ahead with your question? Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, my question is that I still believe that it is uh, relatively easier to bring changes at a policy level, but how do we go about uh, changing the mindset of the common people regarding inclusion and to include the different able people in the daily activities? Okay, so in, in my opinion, that's what the work of advocacy is. That advocacy needs to be done by conducting programs in different universities and at interpersonal level also. But speaking a bit more professionally, if you're at your law school, start one initiative, start reading groups, or start making videos on for on YouTube and Instagram, because that's what I'm also going to do now. That I'm I'll start making videos so that so that people start at least I can put seed into their minds. 
and it can subconsciously start affecting them and that's how conversations start these days for some strategic reasons i have started posting things on linkedin which have been quite effective people, like many people like whenever i meet new people they say oh yeah we have read your linkedin posts on assisting legal education so so i feel those social media is very effective in making people aware about exclusion and that can be for any kind of exclusion i mean be it gender disability or exclusion in general so yeah i would request you to use social media to spread your ideas and start an initiative either at your law school and when you get into some office at your office thank you sir and so sir okay harsh sir no okay got it Uh, and Tanmay is asking, sir, if people just accept that they are not high enough in financial, social standing, and move on, like you said to someone, how will the trend change? Uh, I'm not fully able to understand that question. Uh, so, uh, can Tanmay, can you articulate your question? And or before, meanwhile, we can go move to uh, Ansruta. Please can you go ahead with your question? Yes, sir. Um, so my question was with respect to CLAT. So CLAT has been criticized for multiple reasons. One, primarily because one being the fact that it is conducted in English and it necessitates that you have uh, accessibility to English medium schools for that. But at the same time, we also have to recognize the fact that courts function, especially high court onwards, mentions completely in English. So how, in your perspective, do we address this duality? Sorry, sorry. I think, could you please repeat what is my perspective? So, no, sir. So basically, I was asking you what, how do we address this duality with respect to how CLAD so, is yeah, being yeah. criticized for being conducted oh, in English, no. but the the fact that our legal system okay, works. Okay, okay, got it, got it. So, so yes, that's what I said that, you know, instead, like, in push towards many to be specifically trained students in public speaking in English. And that's what I've been again and again articulating. And I to send the first question also that stand in front of me, not try to improve your grammar, improve whatever your articulation, your fluency and everything. Because of course, English is the language of the court and that's the language which is so popular across the globe. So if you want to seek opportunities in India and outside, you have to be good in English. So work hard and develop your English grammar, vocabulary and everything. So the point, the underlying point is that in any system or social structure, if you find that there's something wrong, something immoral, then the answer, in my opinion, does not lie in appending the entire structure or rising up in revolution. The answer lies in becoming part of the system and then become a moral force inside it and then create a change. So if you feel that English is a barrier, be a part of the system by improving your English and then start a policy debate on whether English is really necessary in courts or not. Can we have proceedings in regional languages? Can we have proceedings in Hindi? So in this manner, in my opinion, that's the way forward. But as of now, what my approach is that I train my mentees and other whale fellows and whosoever come in touch with to improve your language articulation skills. It is not my, my own father, he he was not, he did not go to an English medium school. He went to a school where you would not even require to wear uniform. But then during his university days, he worked hard on grammar. It was some kind of an obsession that he had. And today his grammar skills are more strong than mine, even though I went to an English medium school. So yeah, that's what my thoughts are, thought is. Uh, we can take uh, any other question. Oh, oh yeah, Khadija, please go ahead. Uh, my question relates to accessibility again. 
um there are some disabilities that we absolutely have no accommodation for in the continual education system like hearing disabilities for example so how do you see in future we can integrate uh, people who have hearing disabilities or something similar to that like mental disabilities uh, in india right like so my friend rahul bajaj is there in this meeting so i will request him to please address this question yes yes hi hi i have rejoined sorry i had to leave for a little while i had some personal commitment that i couldn't get out of happy to answer any other questions also that you have but with respect to this question your name is khadija right madam the person who asked khadija yes yes so khadija i think uh the way that we need to move forward on this is that anybody who identifies as having a disability needs to be given the accom- as a general rule needs to be given the accommodation that their disability necessitates now in our act the rpwd act we recognize 21 disabilities i understand your question to mean what do we do about other disabilities that are not covered by the act but that are still debilitating how do we ensure that people in those six circumstances are also given the accommodations that they need to which my answer is that we need to uh, base this on self identification more than anything else of course for certain things like grant of extra time and uh, you know grant of a scribe in exam certain things which may give a disabled pe- person an untoward advantage ha- having some kind of a screening mechanism might be necessary but as a general rule we need to uh, let the person be guided by the person with a disability who has a certain need summer has raised his hand summer Mike. Yeah, hi Rahul. Uh, actually, I have a question like to both of you. Like you uh, so, uh, am I audible, right? Very clearly. Okay. Uh, so, my first first question is the CLAT pattern is very uh, accessible, very non non accessible for the disabled, right? It is a case right. also like Deva Chandra is also give a give his judgment. Uh, and my second, uh, I mean, the questions are like, uh, so you know, idea idea mostly connect this sensitization program in, in some blind school to induct some dis- dis- disabled students in the like NHS for example. So that when the when the students come in the law school. Who's having like studies in the in the high school from the any special uh, blind schools and yes. they are not able to access to the proper English education. So, what is the mechanism to mentor those people in the college? Like I have personal personal experience of it. In my first year, I have two people who are who is not able to not even English or not even Hindi. They are totally can speak in Bengali. So it was right. very very harsh experience for me to mentor all those people and came uh, in the front of the. Uh, this line line of the other people. So, according to you, what would be the mechanism? I think um, that's a very big and difficult question, and I think uh, there's only so much that college education can do to remedy those broader structural issues. I mean, I think that has to start at the school level, um, and we need to get them sort of when they are young and be able to. identify students at that stage and provide them the support that we need at this stage i guess uh, we we're already running behind when we have to make uh, interventions but i guess in like practically speaking all that you can do is i'm sure which you are already doing is to help them to the extent you can right i mean i have this all the time when students with disabilities for example come to me and they don't have very basic skills also in terms of language articulation knowledge of assistive technology and you don't even know where to start but you have to help them as best you can while knowing that the odds are so heavily stacked against them that no matter how much you might help them they will still remain much far behind unfortunately so it's just recognizing that and still trying to be as helpful as possible husain Yeah, I don't know. Yes, so somebody has asked me the question. Tanmay has asked the question that that if people just accept that they do not have adequate capital, then how can they and they take admission in some traditional law school? Then how will the change come? So I mean, speaking from my experience, that I prepared for CLAT with my friends in class eleven and twelve for two years, but. at the last moment i could not even attempt so i had no option but to get into one cheap law school which was near my house that is jam 
So what I did was that, of course, those five years do not bring a smile on my face. Those were difficult years. And the fact that I'm saying, hey, you take admission to traditional law school and they see nothing can do about it. I'm really not discarding the situation. I'm probably a victim of what is happening there on the ground. I'm probably facing more disadvantage than probably you might see some of your class classmates. So what I did was that I started reading a lot of books. The first two years, I did not do any internship. I focused on reading and writing. And I was there all the time, even on Sundays in my library. Then I started doing internships and started meeting people, professionals, academics, and started building my network so that I can see what's really happening there. And then it was my commitment that right from my law school days, I will start training students who are from deprived background. So I started push towards merit in the third year of my law school and even started conducting this study, Jamia Diversity Census, to tell the world that, hey, endless may aisa ho and Jamia may aisa ho rahe. And this is what the reality of exclusion is. And then, as you all can see, now I'm in, in, in one of the most elite offices in the country. I mean, like, Vidhi Center for Legal is the best think tank in India. And we are from one of the top law schools in the world, not in India, but in the world. And even from those law schools, we are some of the biggest achievers. So here, I have not really disconnected myself from the ground. I've started a fellowship, which takes a lot of time. Sometimes it, I have to run it at the cost of my mental peace because it's not easy. Like I'm, I'm part of the busiest team at the Center for Legal Policy. Despite all that, I'm doing all this work. And I did that by improving my articulation, both written and spoken, and by meeting people, by networking. That's also very important. And yes, what I did was, I would still adhere to the fact that when you do not have enough financial resources to get into an NLU, there's no, there's really nothing that we can do because rich become friends with rich. That's how self-interest is appeased. So get into a traditional law school, identify the positive things. The positive things in Jamia were that one, it was in New Delhi. It was cheap. It was near to my house, so I could save time and all. And I think I made the best out of what it had to offer. So yeah, that's what my suggestion is. So, so yes, I'm not at all, uh, you know, discarding or, you know, over liquid what the ground situation is. I'm just speaking from my experience. And of course, this is tough. Those five years were not easy. Even though right now I'm speaking and discarding and easily suggesting a traditional law school medical admission. So yeah, happy to take more questions. Um, seeing that we've almost run out of time. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm so sorry if anybody. I'm madam, madam moderator because I was away. F I, I'm happy to take two final questions because if people had any thoughts, I couldn't attend to those. So if people have two questions, I'm happy to just take them very quickly, and then maybe we can close. Sure, sir. Hmm. Um, Sakib, I think you raised your hand. Would you like to um unmute? Sure, sure. Yeah, go ahead. Sir, uh, I'm from uh, Kaiser University, and um, जैसे मैं English बोलता हूँ, usually तब दोस्तों के सामने या फिर teachers के सामने English बोलता हूँ, तब तुम मैं fluent होता हूँ. But जैसे कोई webinar हो गया या फिर कोई uh, high court का या फिर Supreme Court का judge हो गया, तो उसके सामने मैं इतनी इतनी अच्छी English बोल नहीं पाता. तो उसके लिए कुछ सर्च करते हैं आप? Then maybe you can take this or should I? I mean, I think you will be better equipped to answer this because you've been having this conversation. So, oh, I, I, like, my suggestion would be the same that it comes with practice. For example, one of the most articulate people that I've come across, young articulate people, is Rahul Judge, who is there right now. And I have learned a lot from him also in terms of how to articulate your point clearly. So at this, my suggestion is the same. Stand in front of Mera every day, articulate one legal point, and then also talk about your day. Just talk to yourself in front of Mera. And then that will improve a lot. And everything, reading, writing, listening, speaking, all of them overlap significantly. 
So right now when I'm speaking, I'm probably sort of constructing a sentence with commas and full stops when I'm I'm speaking right now. So this thing becomes even like of course, like I'm not right now perfect, but I'm sure that five years down the line, this process would become even more clear and more automated. Like professors who are very articulate and who are some 60 years old, they articulate you know, their thoughts in text. The text in their mind is running through, that running through in front of their eyes. So I just hope I'm able to reach that level. But it will be great if Rahul can also share his strategy because definitely like he is damn articulate. I I've, I've worked with him on all the projects, almost all the projects. So yeah, he's someone who I admire. So Rahul, thank you, Hussain. Me. Thanks, Hussain. That's very kind. I think uh, I don't really have any profound wisdom to impart on the subject. I all I would say is uh, listen to people who you think speak good English and try to model your speaking style and your uh, vocabulary and style of manner of articulation uh, on that, uh, you know, sort of try to pay attention to the small little things, like how do they negotiate a particular uh, thought that may be difficult for you to articulate right now and how do they get around it. And honestly, we all are learning. I mean, I, my English may be all right, but there are so many other things that I find I'm so inadequate at. And we are all learning. And the important thing is not to get so discouraged that we stop even trying. You know, make a little bit of progress each day. You know, I'll give you a very small example. Um, and because of my disability, you know, I have to face a lot of challenges in litigation, which is what uh, I uh, do nowadays. So, for example, we have this weekly meeting in my office where we go over the cases that are coming up in the next week and plan for them. Normally, I can't listen to that discussion and go through that list at the same time because I listen, right? Because I'm blind, I can't read. So I listen to my talking software on my computer. So I can't listen to the talking software and to my colleagues at the same time because they are two conflicting audio streams. So one thing that I did now is that I have an intern who helps me out with my disability-based challenges. So I made it a point to um, go over all the cases for the coming week with him beforehand, make a list of it in a Word document, so that I know them uh, well and then can contribute in that discussion better. So today I was, uh, you know, I had done that yesterday for the first time. And today when we had that meeting, I was the one who called out all the cases. So when people asked what cases do we have on the 13th, I said X versus Y, A versus B like that. I was able to read them out, which would have absolutely not been possible last week when I didn't have a system for this. So the fact that... Um, I worked on this and found a way out, gave me some degree of confidence. Of course, I wasn't perfect and I may have missed out on certain things and I may have been slower than my sighted colleagues are. But at least I tried and made some progress and that gave me a high degree of uh, some a high degree of self-confidence. Just sharing a very recent example with you. Okay, I think we may absolutely be running out of time and uh, so Madam Moderator, maybe you may want to close it now. Um, yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Hussain. Thank you, Rahul. It was an extremely engaging and insightful session. Um, I see that there are still some questions left, so I'll encourage everyone who wants to pursue this discussion further to uh, mail Hussain and Rahul. Um, I would like to now invite uh, Saksham Chaturvedi. He's the co-convener of the Constitutional Law Society to present the closing remarks. Thank you, Rai. Can you confirm just once if I'm audible? Yes. Yes, you are. Uh, so firstly, thank you, Rai, for hosting the entire lecture. I believe you have conducted the lecture rather skillfully and smoothly. I would like to state my heartfelt gratitude to all the participants for joining us today for this guest lecture. Your presence has made this event truly memorable, and we are truly blessed to have such a supportive and enthusiastic audience. I would like to express my most sincere thanks to Rahul and Hussain for sharing their valuable insights and knowledge with, with us today. Through a discussion with the participants, Rahul highlighted how within our own peer group, we haven't been able to see participation from disabled persons, uh, especially in law school activities and how things are not readily accessible for people who are disabled. 
Rahul also underscored the unfortunate reality through the example of image descriptions, accessible documents and judgments, how these things are so scarcely used by all of us. I believe this discussion has prompted us to be better citizens and counterparts to our differently able peers. And I agree that it would make a world of difference if we become even marginally conscious about such issues. We are deeply grateful to you, Rahul, for your time and sharing your thoughts. I would also like to thank Hussain for his lecture, as well as his support towards making this event possible. Your insights into how high fees in law schools have made them elusive for even meritorious students are truly valuable. This is also what has been specifically highlighted in the findings of the Jami and Diversity Census. Your session also highlighted how the facade of merit hides the lack of opportunity and lack of finances, which has made legal education inaccessible. It is also a sad reality that a person's law school also aggravates the divide when people from traditional universities enter the legal profession. It was astounding to found that uh, such divide is more pronounced within the verticals of caste and gender. In my own experience, I find it true that most top law schools are disproportionately represented. I think it would be true to say that both of these things have drawn a line between legal education and its associated social relevance. I want to congratulate Hussain and Vidhi for their efforts in offering a solution through their intervention, such as what is being done in the form of the Bail Fellowship. I once again thank Rahul and Hussain for the thoughts and the particip participants for their intriguing questions. Lastly, and but not the least, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to our organizing team at Constitutional Law Society for their tireless efforts in putting this event together. Your hard, hard work and dedication have made this event possible. Once again, I thank yes. all the attendees for being a part of this occasion. Thanks very much, Saksham Rai. Uh, I think Rai was the name of the moderator, if I got it right. Yes. Um, and yes. everyone else who was involved in this. Uh, it was a great honor to be here. I'm sorry I had to drop out for a while in between. But thank you for having me. Yes, th thank you, Constitutional Law Society, Katelio Odisha. And of course, these events take a lot of hard work. I know it's just a one and a half hour event, but lots of hard work goes into it, no doubt. So, yeah, I mean, great. It was very, very conducted event, and it was reflected from each and everything the concept note, the email that you shared, and the invite, Google Calendar invite that you shared. So, it was very well managed and it reflects your leadership skills. And because you have great leadership skills, I trust that all of you are in a position to start making changes that Rahul and I talked about in a, in a fleeting manner, I would say. So yeah, good luck all of you for your studies and for, for a bright career ahead. And please feel free to write to Rahul. I shared his email ID and my email ID as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, everyone.